read part of Job 13, when you think of suffering, I guess it's the book, isn't it, that we tend to consider. And these words set in many ways the context for what the Apostle Paul will be saying to us this morning through Romans 5. Job 13, I'll read as far as verse 15. My eyes have seen all this, my ears have heard and understood it. What you know, I also know. I am not inferior to you. But I desire to speak to the Almighty and to argue my case with God. You, however, smear me with lies. You are worthless physicians, all of you. If only you would be altogether silent. For you, that would be wisdom. Hear now my argument. Listen to the plea of my lips. Will you speak wickedly on God's behalf? Will you speak deceitfully for him? Will you show him partiality? Will you argue the case for God? Would it turn out well if he examined you? Could you deceive him as you might deceive men? He would surely rebuke you if you showed secretly showed partiality. Would not his splendor terrify you? Would not the dread of him fall on you? Your maxims are proverbs of ashes. Your defenses are defenses of clay. Keep silent and let me speak. Then let come to me what may. Why do I put myself in jeopardy and take my life in my hands? Though he slay me, yet will I hope in him. I will surely defend my ways to his face. Amen. Let's pray once again. Heavenly Father, we really do need your help above everything. And we thank you that our confidence this morning is not in a preacher, nor in our ability to learn or to understand. But we ask, Father, that you will speak now in that way that helps us understand more clearly your works and your ways in our lives. And that as a result of this, we may love you more and seek to serve you more diligently and obediently in our world. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like you now please to turn to Romans chapter 5. Uh, Romans chapter 5. I'm just going to read a few verses uh, from the beginning of Romans 5. This is the part of God's word which we're working our way through here on Sunday mornings. Romans 5 verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. And hope does not disappoint us, because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, whom he has given us. I read a few moments ago from Job 13, there is so much in the book of Job, which I could have read to you this morning, that reminds us and speaks so powerfully and expressively of Job's own personal frustration with his friends as they sought to apply their own wisdom to the mystery of suffering. Their words, as he speaks there in that chapter which I read to you, are words which in many ways tormented him. You are worthless physicians, all of you. We live in a world today when much is philosophized, much is considered, much is even so-called theologized about suffering. Words are spoken, attempts to comfort, help, explain, the whole phenomena of human suffering and human misery. Many of those words are well-intentioned. But it is the words that God himself gives us that are for the Christian, ultimately, the final word on the issue of suffering. And we have before us here in Romans chapter 5, in particular verses 3 to verse 8, some extraordinarily helpful words from God about the whole business of the Christian response to suffering. 
and indeed the Christian's understanding of suffering. Now, what I want to do is, it's such a big subject, we've got a lot actually to get through today, I hope we will get through it, um, but really it, I want to spend this Sunday and next Sunday looking at this subject of suffering, which is massively important, isn't it? And hugely practical as suffering touches the lives of all of us. Now here in chapter 5, as we've been seeing, Paul is explaining the consequence of what he says in verse 1, that the Christian has been justified through faith. That faith is in Jesus Christ and in Jesus Christ alone. And the justification means that the Christian can stand before the eternal burning purity of God's holiness and be declared by that same God who is of purer eyes than to look upon sin can be declared not guilty, clean, as righteous and acceptable to him as his own son. That is a remarkable thing and that is what the gospel of Jesus Christ draws us to, that we may be justified through faith in Jesus Christ our Lord. Now Paul, as he writes here, speaks about the fact that this is a past event in the life of the Christian. There is no such thing as a Christian who is looking forward to being justified through faith. It is as a result of being justified through faith that we are Christian. And this past event marks entry into the Christian life. But this event, this truth rather, is never to be understood in isolation because of our justification through faith. We have, Paul also tells us in these opening verses, in the present, peace with God. That is an objective peace. It's not that the Christian feels peace. The Christian has peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The war between the Christian and God is over. No longer enemies. Now at peace. And the other thing the Christian has in the present is they have gained access into grace in which they now stand. They no longer live the guilty life before God under the law of God, but the Christian now lives the forgiven life under the grace of God. And as a result of being justified in the past, now having peace with God and access into the grace life, we now look forward, Paul says, to the future. And in particular, the hope of the glory of God, which he writes of there at the end of verse 2. Something we rejoice in. The hope of the glory of God? That Jesus is coming again to this world with great power and glory as Mark tells us in his Gospel. And that when he comes, we will see Christ's glory and be changed into it. 1 John 3 verse 2, But we know that when he, that is Christ, appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So, says Paul, we rejoice in these things. We get excited as Christians about them as we look forward to these things happening. And all of these things are a consequence of our justification through faith. Indeed, Paul, in these opening words, uses some of the most remarkable words in the Christian vocabulary. Peace, grace, joy, hope, and glory. All of this flows into the life of the believer through justification through faith. Now, it's interesting that John Stott, in his commentary on the book of Romans in this passage, when he gets to this point, says... In response to that, it sounds idyllic. It is, except for Paul's next application. What is Paul's next application? Well, as well as those words, peace, grace, joy, hope and glory, he now speaks of suffering. Life that has peace with God and looks forward to future glory is rooted in the hard reality of a suffering world. One of the objections sometimes people make towards Christianity is that it is something entirely theoretical. Pie in the sky when you die. That it's a wonderful idea, but really it's divorced from the nitty gritty of everyday life. If anything that really knocks that idea to one side, it's Paul's words here 
in Romans chapter 5 as he speaks about the nature of Christian salvation and what we have received. Yes, there is peace, grace, joy, hope and glory, but equally there is suffering. And suffering becomes the context for the outliving of the Christian life. And by suffering, Paul is using that word in its most general, elastic sense. That it covers everything. Physical, psychological illness. It covers war, as we think particularly on this Remembrance Sunday. It covers conflict in relationship. Whether on a battlefield, or in a boardroom, or in a classroom, or in a home, in a marriage, between children and parents. Whatever you may understand by suffering and difficulty here this morning is being uh, contained within the use of Paul's word suffering here. But incredibly, when we get to verse 3, Paul speaks about the Christian response to suffering as being this. We also rejoice in our sufferings. Now he's just been speaking about rejoicing in the hope of the glory of God. Of seeing Jesus Christ and being like him. But now he says equally we also rejoice in our sufferings. And you might be sat there this morning well saying well if this convinces me. If anything convinces me that the apostle Paul was insane this must be it. For who in their right mind can rejoice in sufferings? It sounds deeply shocking if not a little offensive. But Paul's point is that there is a further consequence of justification through faith that is so wonderful that even when suffering comes, the Christian ultimately can rejoice. So what Paul is writing here, of course, contradicts massively much of what is said by suffering in our world and much of which is that is said about suffering by some Christians today. Now I want to look very quickly at three controversial areas about suffering. Well, one of them perhaps is controversial. The other two really are just simple observations. But there are Christians today in our world who would tell us and try to convince us that somehow nothing of any good can ever come out of suffering in the Christian life. Indeed, suffering has no place in the Christian life. Now, the most obvious area that I'm thinking of this morning is something, first of all, that's referred to as prosperity theology. Although I'd rather call it teaching because it's not theology, it's, it's aberrant, erroneous, heretical theology. But there are teachers today, often these are the charismatic teachers of God television, which you might see if you've got satellite TV. And they would argue something like this, that the power of the cross is so strong, so glorious, That it liberates us from all effective need in this life. So suffering becomes unnecessary. Now there are theological problems with this. I'm not going to go into detail about this. We simply don't have time. But the punchline of what they preach into the world. To many unsuspecting and often vulnerable hurting people. As they turn on the television looking for some area of hope and comfort in their difficulty is that suffering is unnecessary. It's the result of sin. Christ has triumphed over sin by the cross. Therefore no believer ultimately needs to be sick or in trouble or in financial need. And it's particularly financial need when you listen to them. Instead with enough faith in Christ any Christian can overcome physical sickness trouble or distress or financial hardship. So they would have said to Gareth this morning when he stood up here and said that the students in Cardiff University are a bit strapped for cash. They say there's no need for that at all. All you need is enough faith and eventually all of these things will disappear. Incidentally the expression of having that faith is often encouraged to be seen as being exercised in giving money to the organizations that teach this. Now this is a very popular teaching today and it certainly dominates a lot of so-called Christian television. I watched a fair bit of it uh, last week. Um, I don't do that, I don't do that with all my time usually and I certainly wasn't doing it with all my time last week but it is shocking uh, 
the amount of time that's given to this sort of erroneous teaching. People like Joyce Meyer, Joel Osteen, Benny Hinn, Creflo Dollar, Kenneth Copeland, T.D. Jakes, massively popular empires built on this erroneous theology. Their books sell, their conferences are well attended, and they do extraordinarily well out of this teaching that there's no need for a Christian to experience suffering. For example, the St. Louis uh, Louis, uh, Post-Dispatch newspaper published a four-part special report on Joyce Meyer's finances, admittedly ten years ago, but the situation has changed little, apparently. She owes, owns a $10 million corporate jet. Her husband has a $107,000 silver grey Mercedes sedan. Her $2 million home and houses worth another $2 million for her four children. She has a $20 million headquarters furnished with $5.7 million worth of furniture, artwork, glassware and the latest equipment and machinery, including a $30,000 Malachite round table, a $23,000 marble topped antique commode, who in the world wants one of those, a $14,000 custom office bookcase, a $7,000 Stations of the Cross in Dresden Porcelain, a $6,300 eagle sculpted on a pedestal, another eagle made out of silver bought for $5,000, and numerous paintings purchased for $1,000 to $4,000 each. All of these items paid for by her so-called ministry. She writes this, Why would God want all of his people poverty-stricken while all the people that aren't living for God have everything? I think it's old religious thinking. And I believe the devil uses it to keep people from wanting to serve God. But this is deceptive teaching and it's false. It's very, very popular. These books are popular and they find their way increasingly into mainstream areas today. This is not some fringe of the church, which is why I'm flagging it up for you. But because these things are very, very popular, it doesn't make it right. It is heresy. It's exactly the kind of thing the Apostle Paul warns about in 2 Timothy 4. The time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. Now, this is a myth. And my advice to you this morning is if you ever come across this, don't have anything to do with it at all. Keep away from it. Don't read their books. Don't watch their programs. The influence of U.S. prosperity teachers is growing in the U.K. today. It's probably linked to the recession. Never, ever give them any money, okay? Not a penny. So when characters like the aptly named Creflo Dollar comes along and he says, and I quote from one of his latest things, are you tired of living from paycheck to paycheck? Have you ever observed a need that you longed to meet but didn't have the finances to meet? Do you yearn to sow freely into the needs of the ministry? Do you want more out of life for you and your family? If so, you need the school of prosperity, which you can send him enough money to and you can go to. Frankly, you need to tell him what to do with his school of prosperity because your ministry will just fund his, quote, two Rolls Royces, private jet, million dollar home in Atlanta, 2.5 million dollar home in New Jersey and 2.5 million dollar home in Manhattan, which he recently sold last year for 3.75 million (coughs) dollars. There is a false teaching alive and kicking in the world today which would tell you that what the Apostle Paul is writing here in Romans chapter 5 is entirely unnecessary and merely the expression of lack of Christian maturity and faith in God and the power of the cross. Now the problem is it isn't just the extremes of prosperity, charismatic prosperity teaching where this problem of suffering is seen. There are also some very good Christian people who would never dream of giving a penny 
to people like Benny Hinn and Joel Osteen and the others with their prosperity teaching, but who also fail really to understand the balance that Scripture presents us here in understanding suffering. They're two little groups. I call the first group the triumphalists. Their default setting of the Christian life is victory. The cross is victory. We are children of the resurrection. We're called to joy, freedom and happiness in God. But they make the mistake of believing that this is all we are ever called to as Christians. So there is no room in their thinking for the place of suffering. They do not have a theology of suffering. Least of all, there is no room in their thinking for the constructive work that suffering can do, have within us under God's hand. To the triumphalist, suffering is always bad. Nothing ever good comes out of suffering. So when suffering comes, it's really very frustrating for them. As it doesn't fit with their understanding of the world. Now these people are usually great to be around as they're often very positive people. That is until suffering comes. Then they either ignore you because you're suffering or they become a real pain because they are suffering. The reality is they can't cope with the fact about suffering because it doesn't fit their theology. They do not have a category for it. All you tend to get from them is, well, aren't you better yet? Or an exhortation to rejoice and have faith in the Lord. Suffering is an awkward embarrassment to them, a sign of weakness or a spiritual problem. Worse still is what can happen to them themselves when their life hits the buffers. There can be profound difficulties, ironically layers of depression and darkness descend upon them that are ultimately unnecessary. And it's all because they don't understand the vital place of suffering in God's work in the life of the Christian. Now they're not heretics like the prosperity teachers, but they're unbalanced. They mean well, they just haven't understood what God has to say about suffering. Now as well as triumphalists, you have what I would call the sentimentalists. And these are lovely people. These are the people you want around with you when you're suffering, actually when you're sick. Because they really care. They are 100% genuine in their care. In fact, they are genuinely upset by the fact that you're suffering. Because in their book, nothing good can ever come out of suffering. In fact, being sick or out of work or depressed or broke is always a negative thing in their thinking. Now these people too are unbalanced, mainly because they care so much. Sometimes they can have an unhealthy preoccupation with other people's sufferings. So when they talk, the great topic of conversation is usually about who's sick or what's wrong with them. It's because they love people and they get really upset when they see suffering in other people's lives. But it's an unhealthy imbalance. My nana was like this. I loved her deeply. But you know, watching the news on the TV was exhausting. It really was. Because you'd watch these different things and there would be reports on difficulties and riots and troubles. And, and the room was filled with oohs and ahs and gasps and wails. It was an emotionally exhausting experience. Why? Mind you, she did love a good murder in a detective program. But the point is, she was just constantly overwhelmed by the picture and the reality of suffering in our world. Now, they, these folks, again, the problem is a lack of balance. They're not heretics, like the prosperity teachers, but like the triumphalists, they have failed to understand suffering in its proper biblical context in the life of the Christian. They, too, do not have a theology of suffering. So the prosperity teachers tell us it's unnecessary and a lack of faith. Triumphalists simply say it shouldn't be happening. We should be rejoicing instead. And the sentimentalists just get really upset about it and say it just shouldn't be happening. Now the question before us this morning is this. What then does God have to say about suffering and the Christian life? And here in verses 3 and 4 of Romans chapter 5 we read these crucial words. We also rejoice in our sufferings because we know, here's your theology, that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope.
Now, it isn't just Paul writing here about suffering. The, indeed, I, I was reading, and I tried to avoid reading Dr. Lloyd-Jones on Romans because I'm so easily influenced. And, you know, it wouldn't be good. You, you just tell you, well, you should read him anyway. But I did read him on this because it is masterly. It is a massive pastoral treatise on the issue of suffering. And he makes the point that there is little, if anything, in terms of a theme of the Christian life that is so dominated in the New Testament and given so much time and attention, not just by Paul, but by the other writers, than the subject of suffering. So we read, for example, James chapter 1, verses 2 to 4. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know, there's your theology again, that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. And then there was Peter. His first epistle in particular was written to Christians who were suffering terribly. And in 1 Peter 1, 6 and 7, he wrote this, Though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials, these have come so that, here is your theology, so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory and honour when Jesus Christ is revealed. Again, Paul to the church at Corinth speaks about our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Now Paul, as he writes here, is not writing merely as some sort of abstract theologian. Uh, he's not writing just simply in terms of a, a philosophical understanding of suffering. People do that, don't they? They, they? they talk at length about the origin of evil and why is there suffering in the world and how can God allow this and justice and all of these kinds of things. And, uh, and they can talk for hours and hours and hours about these things. But it's often in the back of my mind, and probably in the back of your mind when you listen to all this, is that at the end of the day, this isn't just about highfalutin ideas. This is about real lives. Now Paul, as he writes about suffering, he writes not merely as a mere theorist, but he himself knew real suffering in his own life. 2 Corinthians 12, verses 10 to 7, this is his personal testimony. To keep me from becoming conceited, because of these surpassing great revelations, there was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more about my weakness, so that Christ's power may rest on me that is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness, in insults, in hardship, in persecution, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So Paul is writing here, yes, as a theologian, but as a sufferer himself. Now the clear overwhelming message of God's word is that suffering is a necessary part of the Christian life. And by necessary, I do not mean it is just one of those things. It is necessary with a capital N. In other words, we need suffering. Now he might say, no, you really have gone off the deep end here this morning. Who in the world needs suffering? Surely that is the last thing our world needs. Well, we must realise that first of all, we're applying this to the Christian. This is something unique to the believer. And what Paul is showing us here, and not only Paul, but the consistent theme of Scripture is that God does something in the life of the Christian through suffering that is unique. He works uniquely in and through this way. Suffering, in other words, performs a vital function in the life of the Christian. Now, as the writer in Hebrews 12 tells us, no discipline or suffering seems pleasant at the time, but painful. It is. And I'm not here this morning to minimise suffering. I'm not going to tell you this morning that because in the end God has got a purpose, then really the suffering is inconsequential, it doesn't really matter and it doesn't really hurt that much. It does. It really does. Do you remember those words from Paul's own testimony? Three times I 
pleaded with the Lord to take it away. But the point is this, though discipline or suffering comes, and though it is not pleasant at the time but painful, later on, Hebrews 12:11 tells us, later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Now, Hebrews 12:11 is a key verse because it speaks about how suffering trains us in the way in which discipline trains us. In other words, there are lessons to be learned. There are things that we may know about God down the path of suffering that we would not learn down any other path. One of the most dramatic things I think I've ever read as a Christian in many ways one of the most initially shocking things I ever read was an essay by the American preacher, pastor and theologian John Piper. It was particularly apt to me because it was at the time when my own father had a diagnosis of cancer and was dying. Piper wrote an article with this title, Don't Waste Your Cancer. That's shocking, isn't it? I read it. It is an extremely helpful essay. He himself had prostate cancer at the time. He has made a recovery. My father didn't. But the point being that with a scenario of suffering is never random. It's never haphazard. It's never just, oh, you're a Christian, you live in a fallen world, and wham, you're just caught up in it, the same as your next door neighbor might be caught up in it next year. We're just victims of some uh, blind fate. No. There is a particular purpose in all of this. And there are lessons to be learned. We are to be trained by it. So don't waste these experiences. This is why to the sentimentalist, their imbalanced view of suffering is so massively inadequate. God does allow suffering into the life of the Christian, but it's for a very precise purpose. So what is so valuable about suffering for the Christian? And this is a vital question. And this is what Paul is addressing here in Romans chapter 5. All Christians experience suffering, despite the best efforts of the prosperity teachers. We are all part of a fallen, sinful universe, where there is sickness, death, disaster, typhoons, accidents, wars, mistakes, chaos. Suffering is controversial. By the way, some reject Christianity simply because of the reality of suffering in our world. There are many, many people today who reject Jesus Christ as the Messiah because they say we still live in a world of chaos. For some, in some situations, an experience of suffering becomes the issue that separates out true and false Christians. Do you remember Jesus' parable of the sower? Matthew 13. And you come eventually in verse 20 and you get these words. The one who received the seed that fell on rocky places, do you remember that was the seed, it it, it grew a little bit, but once the sun came out it withered and died. Jesus said, that's the man or the woman who hears the word, at once receives it with joy, but since he has no root it only lasts a short time, because when trouble or persecution comes because of the word, he quickly falls away. You see, for some people, suffering becomes the acid test of whether they're truly Christian or not. Everything's fine, everything's wonderful. Somebody says, I've become a Christian. They're in all the meetings, they're enthusiastic, they're reading all the books, they can't get enough of it. And then suffering comes. What happens? They turn their back on the whole thing and they walk away. Jesus says the reality is they were never truly born again of the Spirit of God. You see, false faith will fail under the stress of real suffering. How can God do this? But just as false faith will fail under the test of suffering, true faith grows under the stress of suffering. That's what Paul is telling us here. So we need a theology of suffering. That is, we need to understand it from the standpoint of a child of God, in the hand of God. And what is our theology of suffering? What is the Bible's theology of suffering? It is simply this. That firstly, there is always for the believer purpose in suffering. That all suffering, secondly, is under the ultimate control of God. 
And that why God's purpose may not be clear to us as we suffer, we are to have faith that says the Lord knows what he's doing. And we are to be confident that God's purpose within suffering is always, as he will tell us in chapter 8, verse 28, to do his people good. And that the good God does within our suffering is to make us, as verse 29 of chapter 8 will tell us, conformed to the likeness of his Son. So, here is the issue. Suffering is ultimately, for the Christian, all about God doing a work in you, making you more like Jesus. Now, why does God have to do that down the path called suffering, you say? Why can't he do that down some other path that doesn't hurt so much? And therein, friends, we have what is known, and I would say this to you humbly this morning, as the mystery of suffering. I don't know. And I don't think you know either. But what we do know is that down this path comes remarkable things. Two things effectively. We're going to really conclude this morning by looking at the first of these and then God willing next week we'll look at the second but the two things are this firstly this and this is what Paul is teaching us here in this passage suffering leads to spiritual maturity that's what we're going to look at in a moment and then God willing next Sunday morning we're going to look at the second which is suffering is the context for being assured of God's love for us The first, suffering leads to spiritual maturity. In God's hand, suffering in your life is never pointless or never merely destructive. Remember that. No matter how bleak the situation may appear, no matter how dreadful it may appear, no matter how painful it may be, it is never ultimately pointless or destructive. God is always doing something constructive in your life, causing you to be more like his son. He is moving you forward, maturing you, developing, building and growing. Just look at the words we have here. Look at verse 4 about the things that suffering produces. The end of verse 3. We know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, character, hope. They're the three things primarily singled out by Paul here. Perseverance, character, hope. Now this is spiritual work done in us by God the Holy Spirit and the presence of his work within us even through the awful road of suffering is proof of God's desire to move us forwards in the Christian life. Now the first of these three perseverance or patient endurance is all about keeping on keeping on not quitting not giving up. Suffering produces perseverance That is, it is God's work in us. In the field of persecution, we're not called simply to battle through or tough it out under our own resources or by leaning on our friends or our family or the church. Instead, we're to look to God to produce perseverance in us. He never asks you simply to draw on your own resources as your resources like mine are very, very limited. Instead, he encourages us to have confidence in him. That through this path, he is doing something and will do something in you by his spirit which will produce perseverance. What is this? Well, in trials, it seems very clear, isn't it? That in trials and tests or times of suffering, we come to see our need of the Lord afresh. We become more acutely aware of our need of God's grace and help in our lives. So we have experiences where we wake up in the morning and we do not know how we're going to get to the end of the day. Outside of the grace of God. Outside of his mercy. And so like Paul with his thorn in the flesh, we plead with him for help and grace and comfort. Now that need is always there in the Christian. It's always there. But it's only in the arena of suffering that we see it more clearly. Suffering drives the Christian back to God like nothing else. We don't take anything for granted when we're really suffering. And that's why often in times of suffering we pray more. We want God more. We spend more time with him. 
In this sense, you see, this is one of the ways we become more conformed to the likeness of Jesus. Our Lord's own experience in Gethsemane. Father, if you're willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but your will be done. The need to be encouraged. Luke goes on to tell us in Luke 22 that at that point an angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. Why? So that he might go on. That he might persevere. Because the very next thing we're told that being in anguish he prayed more earnestly. Our Lord it seems in Gethsemane is at the moment of quitting under the weight and the strain and the stress and the burden of dealing with the sin of the world. If you're willing, take this cup from me. He prays in desperation. The next thing an angel comes and strengthens him. We do, that's a mysterious thing, isn't it? We don't know what went on there. And the very next thing is he is enabled to pray more earnestly. To the point where Luke records sweat like drops of blood falling to the ground. You see, in suffering, God produces in you, in me, perseverance. You know, it's one of the reasons I think sometimes backsliders are restored in this way. I've often come across people, Christians, and they've lost their way. And then a trauma comes. And they say, now I've realized in the face of trauma, I have to get serious with God again. And so as a result of that trauma, they're brought back to prayer. As a result of that trauma, maybe they're brought back to fellowship with other Christians. Or the reading of scripture. Or they're humble. Painful, painful lessons. They are massively painful, but necessary. Perseverance produces character. Suffering stresses the Christian character and it changes it, it does. It refines us, it builds us, it is altogether constructive. But in particular, I would say suffering does one thing, it does this, it humbles us. Why? When you are really suffering, you know you're up against something that you can't change. You can't. You can't fight it off. You can't laugh it off. You can't shake it off. You can't drink it away. You can't entertain it away. The thing is just too darn big for you. What does that do? It makes you feel small. The person who's not a Christian says, I'm just a tiny speck of dust. In the midst of the vast universe. It's how it makes them feel horrendously lonely and isolated. The Christian is different. The Christian feels small, they are humble, but they know that their life is in the hand of Almighty God. They know they can't fight it. For them ultimately, those words, rage, rage against the dying of the light in the face of cancer, as they were originally written, they know ultimately have no real place. Why? This thing, no matter how much we rage about it, is bigger than us. The Christian also realizes that all of this has come from God's hand. Philippians 1.29 For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for him. 1 Peter 4.19 Those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. And knowing that just frankly humbles you. Humility is often the mark of those who have known real suffering, extraordinary gentleness and tenderness as well in their lives. We were very moved as a church, weren't we? It was probably about three years ago when we had the last combined church's mission. And it was an evening over in my scanner church, you know, where Guion is the pastor. And we piled in to hear Robin Oak speak. This man was a chief, uh, inspe uh, one of the high highest ranking police officers in the country. He was the man who was originally behind the setting up of the anti-terrorism squad in London after the assassination of the uh, MP Airy Neve by the IRA. He was a remarkable man. One day his son, who was also a policeman, was, was killed in the act of arresting a suspected terrorist. And we sat together in that building, hearing this man speak of the suffering in his own life. Tremendous dignity about him. But an overwhelming humility. Can't change the facts of history. Can't turn back the clock. These things happen. They were terrible. 
but a wonderful humility. Acknowledging that all of these things come from the hand of a God who is sovereign. Always. Who never makes mistakes with his people. And ultimately works in all things for their good. By bringing them to conformity to the image of his son Jesus Christ. Ultimately it makes us more useful to others. Paul again in 2 Corinthians he says. Listen he says. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who is he? He's the Father of compassion. The God of all comfort. Who comforts us in our troubles. So that. We can comfort those in any trouble. With the comfort we receive from God. And so when you listen to Christian men like. Robin Oak speaking. Of the overwhelming pain. As a parent, losing a son to the violence of murder. The comfort he received as he speaks becomes a comfort to us. And it is in this sense that we are made more conformed to the likeness of Jesus Christ. As the character that he develops within us becomes one that is closer to himself. And we become more Christ-like. You know the last thing Paul says here is that perseverance <coughs> produces character and character hope. We finish with this. That within the face of suffering the Christian builds and is built up and assured in their confidence in God. You see, what does suffering do to you? It strips away all false supports and props in your lives. Do you think, I'm okay, I've got my friends. I'll get through, I've got my health. Oh, I have my sanity. I have my experiences. I have my material possessions. I've got a nice house. I know that I can get through life with a couple of decent holidays a year. What does suffering do? It gets rid of all of that. It does. When you have real suffering in your life, you know at the end of the day, friends at very best are very limited. And money, quite frankly, as much as you may have, can ultimately do nothing when you have real suffering. And holidays don't mean a thing. You see, what suffering does, it takes us to a place where it's just you and God. It brings you into a room, if you like, where there is no furniture, nothing at all. But it's just you and God. As one hymn writer put it like this, Other refuge have I none. Hangs my helpless soul on thee. Leave? Ah, Leave me not alone. Still support and comfort me. Why? All my trust on thee is stayed. All my hope from thee I bring. Cover my defenseless head with the shadow of thy wing. You see, in the face of suffering, hope in God grows in the believer. And in this sense, again, we are made more conformed to the likeness of Jesus Christ. And in particular in suffering, it is our hope in the love of God. And that's where the next following verses will take us. And God willing, we'll look at this next week. You see, for the Christian, suffering is real. Don't listen to the lies of the prosperity teachers. Suffering is not only real, but it is necessary with a capital N. It is the path God will take you down at times in your Christian life. Why? Precisely because he does love you. And he has a work to do in you, which is a glorious work. It is to cause you to be more and more like his son, Jesus Christ. And his desire is that you might grow in perseverance, in character, and in hope. And though it is painful, it is never an accident, it is never pointless, it is never futile. And that's why we can say that suffering is never ultimately for the Christian, for every single Christian, never a disaster, or at the end of the day, the worst thing that can happen to you. No. Suffering is ultimately the occasion, as Paul tells us here, to rejoice, and to rejoice in God in. 
I really will finish with this. I teach pastoral theology to men. I have a privilege of doing this a couple of times a year with the EMW. I always say to my students this. What is, a, what is a pastoral crisis in the life of an individual? What is suffering when you have that phone call or that email or someone says and the crisis has gone on, there's been a diagnosis or a disaster or a death or a, a redundancy or whatever it is. I say, what is that in essence? There are different ways in which you can look at this. But I encourage these men always to see it in the same way and I encourage you here this morning to see it in the same way. What is an opportunity to be made more like Jesus. Now if that isn't revolutionary, I don't know what is. And if this isn't a reminder that Christianity calls us to something that is utterly at variance with the despair and the hopelessness and the apparent meaningless of our world, then I don't know what is. Well, may God help us to understand these things more clearly. We're going to stand and sing. Now, when peace like a river attendeth my way. And I think we'll, we'll finish just by singing this particular song. Thank you.